Hello there, welcome to Casual Physics. My name is Matt. Uh, today, it's video number three in a series on guesstimation, which is one of my favorite topics to talk about. Uh, it's all about solving impossible problems like how many hairs are on the top of my head. Who knows? But that's the kind of thing you'll be able to calculate by using the tools of guesstimation that we're talking about in this video series. If this is your first guesstimation video, then I highly recommend, at the very least, going back to the first video, which is this one, just to get a few minutes of context uh, to kind of understand what it is that I'm trying to do in this video series. Okay, refresher. Last time, we motivated that the goal of guesstimation is to get things right to within a factor of 10. Why 10? I said, one, it makes the maths easier, and two, I said it, it's essential for dealing with very big numbers and very small numbers using something called scientific notation. And so this is what we're going to be focusing our attention on today. We're going to introduce and motivate the concepts in scientific notation through the impossible problem of how many atoms there are on planet Earth. That's our guesstimation problem uh, for today. So it's worth saying if you're a pro at scientific notation and you feel totally comfortable, you're not gonna miss anything if you skip this video except maybe a bit of fun. So I'll leave that in your hands. Um, if you're a newbie, you've never heard of scientific notation before, don't worry, you're in good hands, you're in the right place. I'm gonna motivate it and take you through um, scientific notation in the context of that planetary scale problem, and then I will link out to some additional resources. I'll put them in the description, and that you can use those resources to practice and get fluent with some of the ideas that we'll talk about today. Ultimately, what I really want is to leave you with a very powerful tool for guesstimating with the largest and smallest numbers in the whole universe, and that's essential for doing any science-based guesstimation. Okay, so how many atoms are there on planet Earth? That's our problem. How are we going to do it? First things first, we need to make sure we are all on the same page when it comes to atoms. And so for this, I'm going to lean on one of my heroes, the brilliant physicist and educator Richard Feynman, who said in his now famous lectures that I will link out to in the description, that all things are made of atoms, little particles that move around in perpetual motion, attracting each other when they are a little distance apart, but repelling upon being squeezed into one another. In that one sentence, you will see there is an enormous amount of information about the world if just a little imagination and thinking are applied. So yes, everything, you, me, water, air, the whole earth is made of atoms, these tiny particles. But how are we going to figure out how many there are on the earth? It seems like an impossible problem, unknowable, a perfect starting point for guesstimation, of course. And so where do we begin? As always, we, we've got to think about what do we already know, okay? So we need to know something about the Earth, something about atoms. So this is the moment to pause and write down anything that you remember about the Earth and about atoms. Okay, we're going to start by thinking about the Earth. And if you remember last time, our guesstimation problem was to calculate the distance to the center of the Earth, the radius of the Earth, which we found to be about 6,400 kilometers. That's one for your mental wiki, I think. Now, the question is, can we do something with that number that's gonna help us solve our problem? We can start to think about the volume of the Earth. How much physical space does the Earth take up? Now, why is that helpful? Well, because the Earth has volume, it takes up physical space. That means atoms have a tiny little volume of their own. Do we know what that is? Or could we figure it out? And if we can, then we can start to think about calculating the number of atoms by simply doing the volume of the Earth divided by the volume of each atom. And so this is our kind of trajectory today to calculate these two quantities. And let's begin with the volume of the Earth. How are we gonna calculate this? Well, just like last time, we are going to use the outrageous approximation that the Earth is a giant cube, not because I hate pi, but I don't want to overcomplicate things for now. So the volume of a cube is just the width and then multiply the width by the depth and multiply by the height, which for the cube is the same number three times. We call it D because it's the diameter of the Earth, which is just twice the radius of the Earth. And, you know, we do a bit of mathematical jiggery pokery to collect those twos together and then substitute the 6,400 kilometers in. But remember, in science, we tend to use meters, not kilometers. So we need to add an extra three zeros to those numbers because there's a thousand meters for every kilometer. Now it's at this point 
in the calculation there, it's starting to look a little bit unwieldy and we could do with a more compact way of writing these numbers. So let's see what that could look like for the radius of the Earth as an example. We can write this as 6.4 times 10 to the power of 6. That's how we say this. And it's our first example of scientific notation. What it means is take 6.4 and multiply it by 10 six times. That's what it means. That little 6 there, that's often called the power or the exponent more formally, and it controls the number of times we're multiplying by 10. So let's check that this idea makes sense and actually do these multiplications. So 6.4 multiplied by 10 gives us 64, and we reduce the exponent by 1. Then we get 640, then 6,400, 64,000, 640,000, and finally 6.4 million. So it's great. It's consistent. It makes sense. Now, you might think this is a bit overly complicated. After all, what's the problem of writing out you know, a few extra zeros in this particular case? It's not a big deal. But let's see how this plays out when we go back to our volume formula. So we can replace our radius with 6.4 times 10 to the power of 6. Rearrange things a bit because we're allowed to do that. And then we can guesstimate. So 6.4 is approximately 6. 8 sixes are, of course, 48. 6 sixes are, of course, 36. In the world of guesstimation, 48 is basically 50, 36, it's basically 40, and we do that to make the maths easier so that we end up with 2000 times 10 to the power of 6 times 10 to the power of 6 times 10 to the power of 6. So how many 10s do we have here? 6 from the first, 6 from the second, and a final 6 from the third. So we're actually multiplying by 10 a total of 6 plus 6 plus 6, 18 times. Which means instead of writing 3 10 to the power of 6's, we could write something a lot shorter. We could write this, 2000 times 10 to the power of 18, where we've just added those powers, those exponents together. And by doing so, we've created a much more compact way of writing that very big number. And so hopefully at this point, now you can start to see a little bit about why scientific notation can be really useful. And maybe, just maybe you're starting to think, well, maybe we can do the same thing for that 2000 as well. Write it in scientific notation. And this is exactly what I'd like you to have a go at now. I'd like you to write this in terms of scientific notation. So blank times 10 to the power of blank and essentially fill in the blanks, pause the video and think about what those numbers could be. OK, the answer is two times 10 to the power of 3. That is 2,000 in scientific notation. If that makes sense, then great. If it's still not clear, do not panic at all. If this is your first time doing scientific notation, it's probably not super easy and intuitive. So just remember, I've put links in the description where you can get a lot more opportunity to practice some of these things. For now, though, stick with me because we've still got more to do. We can now replace this 2000 with our 2 times 10 to the power of 3. Just like before, we can add the exponents together to make something more compact, which is 2 times 10 to the power of 21 cubic meters, which if you want a word for that, it is 2000 billion billion cubic meters. But who cares about words when we have this beautiful scientific notation? OK, that's the volume of the Earth. Now what about the volume of an atom? That's the other number that we need. So now let's think about atoms uh, or elements. Uh, there's lots of different kinds as exemplified by this comprehensive, if not intimidating, periodic table that lists them all. On Earth, we've got a lot of these, some more than others. Iron comes up at the top, followed by oxygen, then silicon and magnesium. And those make up just over 90 percent of the Earth's mass. So as you might imagine, those different elements have different sizes. And so when we think about the volume of an atom, do we need to do some kind of average with a bit of iron, some oxygen, some silica? No, nobody's got time for that. Not in the world of guesstimation. We're busy people. We want an answer that is good enough. And what it turns out, which is wonderful news for us, is that approximately, roughly, to within a factor of 10, all atoms have about the same size, which is really good news for us. And it turns out to be one tenth of a billionth of a meter, which is this 0.0000001 no, 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 meters, which is a teeny tiny number. And uh, as you might have already guessed, 
we've got a compact way of kind of writing this down. But before we get there, it's worth considering just how small atoms actually are. How small really is this number? Consider this juicy looking apple. If you wanted to hold an atom of this apple in your hand, just like the lady is holding the apple, then you're going to have to enlarge this apple to a very large degree. You're going to have to enlarge it until it is the size of planet Earth, which is mind-blowing. Another way of thinking about this is that the atom is to the apple what the apple is to planet Earth, which is it's just bonkers how small atoms really are. And this is why we don't have an intuitive understanding about the size of atoms from our everyday experiences. And we only figured out how small atoms really are by firing x-rays onto various materials and then looking at the detailed patterns of the scattered x-rays, as you can see in an excerpt from Bragg's original 1913 paper, where we can see in the bottom right-hand corner that characteristic pattern for just common table salt. But I digress. Yes, the radius of an atom is teeny tiny, and it's one of those numbers you should just commit to your mental wiki because it's just not intuitive. But before you commit this very long looking number to your mind, let's make it look more compact. And just like last time, we can use scientific notation to write it more conveniently as one times 10 to the power of minus 10, which sounds very strange. Take one and multiply it by 10. Minus 10 times? Clearly it doesn't make sense. That's because this minus sign is a bit special. Somebody decided a long time ago that a negative power means divide instead of multiply. So this means take one and divide it by 10, 10 times, which looks wild if you write it out fully. So clearly a compact notation is good, but this strange looking minus sign isn't the only way of doing it. So let's actually do this crazy looking division and see another way. So we have one tenth at the top, divide it by 10 gives me one hundredth. Divided by 10 again gives me 1,000th, again 1 10,000th, then we end up with a 100,000th, a millionth, 1 10 millionth, 100 millionth, 1 billionth, and then 1 10 billionth, which we can of course write using scientific notation as we've learned to do, so 1 times 10 to the power of 10. And so this is another perfectly good shorthand for the teeny tiny radius of an atom. You'll see people write it that way. You'll want to write it that way sometimes as well. Small note, you'll sometimes see the one disappear like this. People often just drop the one, and that's because you don't lose any information by doing that because everything can be multiplied by one and it changes nothing. So what we have here is two ways of writing very small numbers in a very compact way. The first is using negative powers or negative exponents, and the other is using division with positive powers. Either way, what we're doing here is we're representing a teeny tiny fraction of a meter. Okay, this negative powers business probably sounds still a little bit strange, so it's worth taking a moment to say that the reason we have positive and negative powers representing multiplication and division is because plus and minus are opposites like multiplication and division are opposites. And so you take the, the, the kind of more complicated problem of multiplying and dividing numbers, and that gets turned into pretty much the addition and subtraction of powers, which is a lot easier. So this is kind of the motivation. And don't worry if that still sounds a little bit abstract and unintuitive. Uh, honestly, just you will get more familiar with more practice and seeing it in action. And we're gonna have plenty of opportunity to see it in action throughout this video series. So, back to our problem, the volume of an atom. We're going to take the cube approximation for the Earth and just apply it to the atom. Volume is eight times the radius, three times. Radius is 10 to the power of minus 10. And so we have eight divided by 10, 10 times, and then again, 10 times, and then again, 10 times. So in total, we're dividing by 10, 30 times. So just like before, we can combine the powers together, add them up to give us eight times 10 to the power of minus 30 cubic meters, a really tiny volume for the, uh, for the atom. And now we have everything we need. We've got the volume of the earth, the volume of the atom. Now it's time to plug in the numbers. Two times 10 to the power of 21, eight times 10 to the power of minus 30. A bit of mathematical jiggery pokery to separate the terms. 
2 eighths is the same as 1 quarter, 1 quarter is 0 0.25, and now the question is what to do with this 1 divided by 10 to the power of minus 30. Well, 10 to the power of minus 30 is just a fraction, albeit a tiny one, and we can write that fraction explicitly in the way we've just learned, 1 divided by 10 to the power of 30. Now we're in a similar situation to doing 1 divided by a tenth, which is 10, or 1 divided by a hundredth, which is 100. We've got 1 divided by 10 to the 30th, and so this is just 10 to the 30. And now we're back in familiar territory again. We can combine the powers by simply adding the numbers up to get 10 to the power 51. And then we can steal one of those 10s to turn the 0 0.25 into 2.5 times 10 to the power of 50. And that is the total number of atoms on planet Earth. And just to remind you, that's 2.5 multiplied by 1 with 50 zeros after it, a truly monstrously large number that I challenge anybody to write out in full without losing track of all the zeros. And there we are, another impossible problem solved with the powers of guesstimation. As always, if you solve the problem in a completely different way to me, that's great. I'd love to hear about it. Pop it in the comment section below. Hopefully, you're starting to see the value of scientific notation, and then it will be an indispensable tool for you in general. And in terms of guesstimation, it's super helpful because it allows us to keep track of those factors of 10, and that's the thing that we're really interested to get right. For example, you might remember last time I talked about estimating the mass of a human, and I said, you know, 10 kilograms, too small, fat cat, 1,000 kilograms, too big, that's a car, and we landed on about 100 kilograms as, you know, roughly the right kind of sense of scale within a factor of 10, this is right. Now we can represent these numbers using scientific notation, and now you can see explicitly how it's the exponent, the power, that we're really interested in, because increasing or decreasing it by one changes things by a factor of 10. And so we're going to be very often interested to write things in terms of scientific notation, even if the numbers are not crazy big or small, because it allows us to see very quickly whether we've got those factors of 10 right. Okay, that's it for today. For those who are new to scientific notation, I hope this has been a great primer and motivation for it. Remember, lots more for you in the description below. For the pros out there, if you're still with me, hi, um, I hope this has been a great refresher for you. And for everybody, just I hope it's been fun to think about another planetary scale problem. Next time, we're going to jump straight into a food-related problem, and I'm going to expose you to what I think is the most powerful tool in the whole of the guesstimation toolbox, so something to look forward to. As always, thank you for your time and attention. I look forward to hearing from you in the comments section and seeing you very soon. Bye for now.